In this video lecture, we're going to look at the functional anatomy of the digestive system. We're going to continue our trip down the digestive tract. Um, remember the previous video, we went mouth to stomach, so now we're going to go small intestine to large intestine. But I'm actually going to divide this up into three videos, uh, so you'll want to watch for those on my YouTube channel um, to make sure you get the other two in. This one, we're going to concentrate on the small intestine. In the next one, we'll look at the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. And then the third one will be the large intestine. So we're starting at the small intestine, as I said, and let's see what it looks like. Well, the small intestine is divided up in three parts. The first part that's connected to the stomach is called the duodenum. Now, the duodenum is only about 10 inches long. It's going to get the food, or now we're going to call it chyme, from the stomach and it also gets the secretions from the pancreas and the liver or gallbladder. The second part is the jejunum. It's about eight feet long. It is where a lot of the chemical digestion and nutrient absorption takes place. And then the third part is the ileum, the longest part. It doesn't do a whole lot. It does some more absorption, maybe some water absorption. Lots of bacteria live in there to digest some of the food and utilize it themselves. Um, but it ends in what's called the ileocecal valve. And this is a valve that can, that's a sphincter valve that connects the large intestine with the small intestine. And therefore, it can control movement of the food from the ileum into the cecum. Now, if we look at the structures of the small intestine, um, I want you to think it's all about surface area. Everything in this small intestine is about making more surface area so we can maximize con um, contact of that food with the wall so we get good absorption. Um, we want to maximize surface area so we can get uh, what we'll see a brush border enzymes in contact with that food so we can digest stuff. So if you look at the, these structures, the first, the biggest one, are these circular folds over here. Now these circular folds have kind of a rifling pattern to them. Think of it as kind of like a corkscrew pattern that runs down that small intestine. Now it's rifling like a rifle. A rifle, if you look up its barrel, actually has grooves on it that are, are shaped or, or run like a corkscrew. And that's to make the bullet spin. Now if you make the bullet spin, you can more accurately hit your target, just like a football. If you're good at getting a football to spin when you throw it, you're more likely to, re to get the pass to your receiver. I stink at it, but that's the idea. Um, but now, of course, we don't have rifling in our small intestines, so we more accurately hit the toilet with our fecal material. Um, the Really, the reason we have the, the, the circular folds of that rifling is to get the food to spin. If we get the food to spin, then more of that food is going to come in contact with the wall of the small intestine and therefore better digestion and better absorption, which of course is the, what we need the small intestine to do. Now another structure is the villi here. These villi are little finger-like projections that you can see on the surface of these circular folds. So here's two different circular folds. I should mention too that circular folds increase surface area quite a bit as well. And then the villi are these little fingers sticking out all over the place. Um, and those, again, add surface area to that small intestine. Here's one of those villi um, kind of blown up and then, and then cut in half so we can see what's inside. Uh, so you can see the epithelial cells here. Those are the columnar epithelial cells. And then up each finger, in the middle of each finger, are some capillaries and lymphatic vessels. Now these lymphatic vessels are called lacteal, uh, but they're there so that when the nutrients are absorbed through those columnar cells, the blood and lacteal can pick up those nutrients and carry them on to other parts of our body. And then the surface area continues to be increased by a structure called microvilli. If you take one columnar cell and you look, you can see little they're almost like little microscopic fingers that stick out of the cell membrane. And it is actually the cell membrane that's bending back and forth and back and forth to create these microvilli. So we've got circular folds, we've got villi, we have microvilli, all working to increase the surface area of the small intestine. If it's so much surface area that if I took the a small intestines and laid it out flat on a surface, and so I 
undid all the folds, spread out all the villi, spread all the microvilli, um, I would be able to cover a huge area with the small intestine. Matter of fact, that area was so large, it'd be the same size as a tennis court. So that's a lot of surface area in our little gut. Now there's a bunch of cells, of course, along the small intestine that have to do different functions to help with digestion and absorption. And those cells are housed in between the fingers or along the fingers. So here's one of the micro, or excuse me, the villi um, or the fingers. And then, so this is the villus. And then down here where the two villus come down, there's kind of just a little cave that they call the crypt. Now these cells are positioned along the villus or the crypt and they do different functions. So first of all, we've got the absorptive cells. The absorptive cells are all call, also called enterocytes. If you think of the word entero refers to intestine, site cells. These are intestinal cells. Their job is to, in, um, to absorb nutrients and you can see there's lots of entero cells going on there. Then we've got the goblet cells. The goblet cells are for secreting mucus, so we can have a, a kind of lubricate the food as we go, um, reduce the friction along here, um, but also the mucus cells, particularly in the duodenum, uh, secrete buffers, uh, secrete like an alkaline or a, a basic solution to help counteract the effects of the acid. So it neutralizes the acid. And of course, you know, the stomach acid is really low, low, low pH. So we need to make sure um, we neutralize that because this small intestine doesn't have that protective thick mucus layer that the stomach has. Uh, the panath cells secrete lysozyme. Oh, there it is again. I think there's a couple other times I've mentioned lysozyme and a couple other structures. Let's see if you can think where they are. And they, of course, lysozyme is there to destroy bacteria. So we want to get that population down um, we're never going to get rid of them all, but we want to get rid of a few of them uh, to make sure they don't take over, I guess. Um, the enteroendocrine cells uh, secrete intestinal hormones. You remember, we've got a lot of hormones needed to regulate uh, the gallbladder, the pancreas, and particularly the stomach. We I mentioned three intestinal um, hormones in the last video. That was uh, secretin. Um, GIP or gastric inhibitory hormone, uh, peptide hormone, and then CCK or cholecystokinin. And so we talked about their functioning. We'll come back and, and talk a little bit more about them later. And then of course, the stem cells. Now the stem cells or progenitor cells are there to replace all the differentiated cells. Now the differentiated cells are all these other cells above. So the absorptive cells, goblet cells, panid cells, Enteroendocrine cells are all differentiated cells because they have particular functions. So they've been differentiated. Stem cells and progenitor cells are cells that can become any kind of cell or a, a limited number of cells in this case. And so um, they're there to replace those guys because the differentiated cells are replaced about every two to four days. So, uh, you know, as food moves through, those cells get worn out and they get sloughed off. So we got to make sure we have some kind of cell there to replace them. And so that's what the job is of the stem cells and progenitor cells. Now all along the surface of the cell membrane in the um, small intestine are going to be what's called brush border enzymes. These are integral proteins. You can see they're embedded here. So these are the microvilli of uh, one of the columnar cells lining the intestine. And so embedded in the membrane are these um, enzymes. Their job is to do the final little bit of digestion of the chyme or the food. So let's say you have a disaccharide, one of these enzymes its job is to break that disaccharide into two monosaccharides. And then that monosaccharide is right there on the surface of the columnar epithelial cell to be absorbed right into that cell and then hopefully uh, get absorbed into your blood. Now the chyme has to come in contact with the brush border enzyme. It's not like the enzyme can leave the cell membrane, go do di some digestion and come back for a break. No, it's embedded in here, it's not gonna move. So it's, that's why it's important to keep that chyme mixing and churning in the small intestine so that food has a better chance of 
hitting those um, enzymes, those brush butter enzymes, and getting their final last little bit of digestion going. Now, all kinds of intestinal secretions going on in the intestines, um, but the intestinal juice, the fluid we see in the intestine, is secreted primarily by cells in that crypt, not in the villus. Remember, the villus is mostly absorptive cells, so any of those secretions are going to be down in the crypt, and it's going to contain things like um, water and buffers, again, to neutralize the acid of the stomach and mucus. So that's primarily what it secretes. But notice that the intestinal juice is what's called enzyme poor. It's not, notice it's not included in the list is enzymes. All, only enzymes that the, in, that the intestine makes are those brush border enzymes, and those get embedded in the wall or in the cell membrane of those columnar cells. So all the, a lot of the enzymes, or practically most of the enzymes um, that are used for digestion in the intestine have to come from the pancreas. And then they mix with the food once they enter that small intestine and they'll do their job digestion. And we'll look at that, what those enzymes are when we talk about the pancreas. Now this, um, the secretions are regulated by local reflexes and parasympathetic reflexes, or local reflexes are the short reflexes, those enteric reflexes. Now the parasympathetic nervous system can increase secretions um, while we're in that cephalic phase. Remember the cephalic phase is the first part of regulating gastric secretions when we're thinking about food or smelling food or seeing food. and it's kind of a, a way to rev up your digestive tract because if you see, smell, or think about food, you're probably thinking about, oh, I'm going to go eat something. So we want to get that digestive system prepped, getting it ready for um, ingestion of food. So the this is going to start secreting some of those intestinal secretions, getting this intestines ready. Now the uh, sympathetic nervous system can actually decrease uh, secretions of intestines and and that because remember we're trying to uh, think about fight or flight so we're more concerned about muscles and heart rate and breathing and all that to be able to beat the guy up instead of we're not really worried about what's going on in the digestive system if we're revving up our sympathetic nervous system. Motility, movement through the small intestine. Well we've got segmentation um, segmentation is going to be mixing food, remember. It's not to move food along. We use peristalsis to move the food along. And that's usually peristalsis only is going to happen after the food's been or the nutrients have been absorbed. So you can see you get a lot of segmentation going on in this section of the small intestine. And then as, as a lot of that food becomes absorbed, then we get peristalsis and move the and then we get the next chunk of food come in, more segmentation, done a mixing, digestion, absorbing it, moving along. So it's like a conveyor belt. We're just moving stuff along, dealing with little chunks of it at a time. So remember also during the intestinal phase of gastric regulation, um, it's just the, the small or the small intestine slows down the stomach so that the stomach only empties little bits of its content at a time, so the, the small intestine has a chance to process it. So we're just doing that. We're just going to slowly work a little bit of it at a time. Also, the peristalsis then is kind of a house cleaning chore to slough off the mucus cells, the debris, and the bacteria as well, so we can get rid of that stuff and replace it with good cells that aren't worn out. Peristaltic contractions are also controlled by local reflexes or those short reflexes. They're not controlled by the central nervous system. So we have what's called, an example of it is a gastroenteric reflex. Now think of this term, gastro refers to stomach, entero or enteric is intestines. So think of this as the stomach telling the intestines to do something. Well, it's triggered by distension in the stomach. So that's the stimuli. So this, this distension in the stomach leads to glandular secretions in the small intestine and peristaltic movements to get stuff moving. So in case there's some stuff, like particularly at the end of the small intestine, there's still some food there, maybe that's not digestible, we can move that along so we can prep the small intestine for the food that's gonna be coming that the, that the stomach is processing right at the moment. Okay, so we got to get the small intestine 
um, secretions going. We've got to get the stuff that's been sitting there moving along. So we're ready. So the small intestine's ready to go when the stomach does insert or eject some of its food or chyme into that small intestine. The other reflex is going to be relaxation of the ileocecal valve. That reflex is called gastroileal reflex. Again, think of this as the stomach telling the ileocecal valve to relax. This happens to be a long reflex um, and it's again triggered by stomach activity, but it does once the stomach again gets distended, just a long reflex through the central nervous system um, to the ileocecal valve getting that valve to relax. So again, any leftover stuff in the small intestine can move out of the small intestine into the large intestine, there make, thereby making room in that small intestine for the food to be coming. Okay, so it can process at that food. It also responds to levels of gastrin. One of the things gastrin does, it, besides revving up the stomach, so it does its job, is to relax that ileocecal valve as well. All right, so that ends this part of our part one of this video lecture. Then the next part, we're going to move on to the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas.